Hi, Dave here to talk about Chapter 7 on Inheritance. This will be the first of a two-part video series. Part 1 will focus on Section 7.1. Part 2 will focus on Section 7.2 and 7.3. I'm going to start off with a quick review of best practices. I'll then have a little bit about administration with how do you get the project archive or examples from today's chapter. And then we'll stage do a little stage setting with talking about composition and terminology, then we'll get into inheritance. In terms of best practices, the chapter follows all best practices as well as, as you should. That way all of us will develop with the same style and in the same way so all of our code will be more easily readable and maintainable and extensible. So we're going to follow Oracle coding in Oracle Javadoc conventions. All our data members will be private. We'll have a default constructor and a copy constructor. We'll have getters and setters. We'll override the equals method and we'll override two string method. In terms of class examples, I took chapter seven and put it out on Moodle as an Eclipse project archive. You can also get these from the CD in the back of the book. And I want you to spend a few minutes and review the code for date and employee. One, for best practices, and two, to see about how date and employee use composition. I want to str stress right now that a lot of students, when they learn about inheritance, go crazy with inheritance. And they forget about the power of composition. One of the key design rules is to prefer composition over inheritance so let's not lose sight of that. Now, composition is referred to has a, as a has a. So a date object has a string instance variable month. How does date get its composed object month to reference? Okay. Employee, each employee object has a date instance variable called hire date. and also has, has a string instance variable called name. How does each employee object get its composed objects of higher date and name to reference? So take a, pause the video, take a look at the code, and then hit continue. Well, date. Date is composed of an instance of month, and it can get that either through the constructor at time of creation, like new date, February 26, 2012, or it can get it through the setter. So after construction, we can call the set date method. Employee, similar strategy. It, ha it has a higher date and it has a name. It can get those through the constructor at time of construction, or it can get those by calling the individual setter methods. In terms of best practices, I'm showing the Eclipse package for the class date in the Eclipse package for the class employee. I'm also showing the UML representation of both. Note here I'm showing in, in pink that the date is private. I'm sorry, that the data members are private, that I have five constructors, one of which is a copy constructor. I also have a default NOAA constructor. I'm overriding the equals method. I'm overriding the two-string method, and I've got getters and setters for the data members. Same with employee. I have private data members. I have a no-log employee constructor. I have a copy constructor for our employee, and I've got getters and setters for the data members, and I override equals, and I override two-string. A lot of times in a job interview, we're going to be asked, what are the three key features of object-oriented programming? We've already learned about encapsulation. Today, we're going to talk about inheritance. And then next week, Joel will talk about polymorphism. Please note, you cannot have polymorphism without inheritance. Terminology may seem confusing. Here in the left column, I'm showing in green terms that are typically used interchangeably. In a blue, I'm showing terms that I typically use interchangeably. On the right-hand side, I'm also showing that we're going to be talking about overriding versus overloading a method. You need to understand the difference between the two. We're talking about inheritance. 
and we're going to be using the keyword super. So a big part about inheritance is the ancestor and the descendants, the parent and the children. So here, employee is the parent of hourly employee, and hourly employee is the parent of full-time hourly employee. We go from general to specific. A big part of the class hierarchy is that an instance of any object can always put, be put into a variable of a type of anyone in its ancestry. So I can create three different variables of type employee, emp, emp1 and emp2. And I can put into these variables an instance of itself, like new employee, but I can also put into it an instance of any of its children. And we're gonna find out the power of this over the next few classes. So introduction to inheritance, we're going to have a parent class called employee. We can give some other aliases for that same class. We're going to have a child of employee. I'm going to call that a derived class, subclass, etc. Now, the child is going to inherit all the instance variables, all the static variables, and all the methods of its parent. And it can also go out and should go out, or most likely will go out and create additional instance variables and additional methods. The ones that it inherits, it does not have to repeat the code. It automatically gets it. And when we're a child class, we're going to say that we are we're going to use is a. So a child class is a same type as its parent. So an hourly employee is a employee. And the way we signify inheritance in code is with the word extends. So if I want to create hourly employee to be a child of employee, I would say public class hourly employee extends employee. I can only have one parent, single inheritance. So please go out and look at the hourly employee code. And in particular, look how it used the word extends and how it's used the word super in its constructors. Please pause the video and then continue when you're ready. If we look at hourly employee, it starts off with declaring the class and then it's the fact that it extends employee. Because it extends employee, it gets all the instance variables, static variables, and methods of the employee class. It does not have to repeat them. In addition, it's added two additional variables, wage rate of type double and hours of type double. It has three constructors and note that the first line of each constructor is a call to super. And that in turn will call the constructor of its parent. Now, the first line was super, means to call or construct your parent first before you construct yourself. Think about a donut. Hourly employee must create the instance of employee before it can create itself. That's why the first call is to super. Another way to think about it is since I first got to create my parent, I get all the data members, all the methods created first inside of me so I have access to it, and then I create my own additional variables in data members. So when a derived class is defined, it is said to inherit the instance variables and methods of its base class. I also, beyond those variables, are going to have the ones that I create. Now, just as I inherited the instance variables of my parent, I also inherit the methods. And I can use the methods of my parent just like my own. But occasionally, I might inherit a method, but I want to change its behavior. I want to do something a little bit different. That's fine. That's called overriding. For example, in the employee class, it has a method equals to test whether two employees are equal. In the child hourly employee, I want to override equals because my test is not going to be the same as my parents. So here I'm showing the public class employee 
its equals method, I'm showing its child, hourly employee, which extends employee, also redefining the equals method because it wants to test things a little bit differently. Now, people get confused between overriding and overloading. When a method is overridden, the new method definition has the exact number and type of parameters as the parent does. In fact, you'll see the annotation override put above it a lot of times to say that I'm overriding a parent method. And if I'm not overriding a method, the compiler will catch it and give us an error message. Now, if I'm giving a method and has a different number or type of arguments as a method in the base class, I'm not overriding it, I'm overloading it. Here's an example of overloading with the math class. It's got four different calls to the min method. And the way it's overloaded is each one takes different types of arguments. Super. Super is the first line within the constructor of a child class. Right? We need to create the parent before we can create ourselves. And super is going to take zero or more arguments. And depending on the number and type of arguments, we'll go up to the parent and look for a constructor that takes that number of type of arguments and call that constructor. Now please note, I can never use the actual name of the constructor. I have to use the word super, and it has to be the first line of my constructor. If a derived class constructor does not have the word super to start it off, then the compiler will automatically call the no argument constructor of the parent class. If there is no, a no argument constructor in the parent, then we'll throw an error. That's why one of our best practices is to always provide a no argument constructor. Now, an instance variable that is private in the base class, I cannot get at it directly in a child class because it's private. The way I get at it is through one of its public, public accessor and mutator methods. Private methods in my parent, I cannot get at, and I cannot easily get at them from my child unless the parent class has a public method that in turn calls the private method. Final example, in the book, there was an inheritance demo example. Now, an inheritance demo had a main method that created an instance of inheritance demo and then called go. In the creating of the instance, we call the constructor, and it set the data member Joe to an instance of an hourly employee that was created with the four argument constructor. And inside of go, we show that we can access the parent employee's get name method directly. We can access set name directly as if it was our own. And then we can call our own two string method. Let's look at the constructor for the call to new hourly employee. I'm showing the source code here for hourly employee that extends employee. The four argument constructor is right here. The first call is to super, which means go out to my parent and call the 2R constructor. The parent is shown up above, employee. The 2 argument constructor is the name and date. So that got called first and got put away. I then came down and set my local wage rate in hours variable that we see defined here. So simple enough. Now... After we created, we did get name. We see that it comes up here. We changed the name to Josephine. And then we're going to call the two string method on Joe. The two string method defined an hourly employee shows a nice use of methods both from the parent and access to data members of our own hourly employee class. So here I'm calling get name that I inherited from employee get hire date that I inherited from employee, and then I'm directly accessing my wage rate in hours. 
That concludes this video. Next video, we're going to look more at type. The words final, super, this, protected in package access, along with the class object, and the use of two methods, get class and instance of. Thank you.